Along with the gold prospectors and the railroads, one of the great industries that launched the West was the cattle industry. There had been cowboys for centuries in the American West in the form of Mexican cowboys called vaqueros. The settlers from the East actually transformed this word somewhat into the Americanized buckaroos, which is a phrase you might have heard in describing the American cowboy. But those beginning to engage in the cattle industry modeled themselves after the Mexican cowboys, borrowing from them uh, in terms of dress and their methods and the tools that they used in the cattle industry. There had been ranchers and cowboys uh, in the West since the 1830s, but it's the railroads, as they begin to progress across the West, that really launch the cattle industry into an incredibly profitable enterprise. The process involves raising the cattle down there in the far reaches of Texas. And if you look at the map to the east, you will notice the expanse of Texas with all the blue lines coming out of it. Uh, those are the trails that the cowboys would use to drive the cattle from Texas up to wherever the rail line uh, ended at that particular year. If we think back to our sports nicknames again, the Texas Longhorns may spring to mind. And if any of you have been to Austin, Texas, you would surely see the Longhorn steer right there. Uh, across the street from the airport is a huge field filled with the longhorn steer. And so the cattle would be raised down there in Texas and then driven uh, by virtue of what we call the long drive. And of course, we're not talking about cars or automobiles at that point, but uh, the cowboys would herd the uh, steer along on this drive hundreds of miles, even thousands of miles, uh, up to the railhead at that point. This was a very profitable enterprise. Uh, the cattle themselves were very cheap, and of course, once you had uh, established a herd, they replicated themselves. Uh, the feed was very cheap or free. The cattle just grazed on the natural grasses of the landscape. So the greatest difficulty was in simply keeping them alive and then getting them to the railhead. Um, but because it was so profitable, this led to a couple of decades in which the cattle industry flourished in the central uh, southern United States. From 1866 through 1886, about 6 million head of cattle were driven from Texas up to the rail lines. Well, if this was such easy money, why didn't everyone participate in it? And of course, the answer is that while the money might have been very profitable, the process itself was quite difficult, and it took an especially courageous and rugged sort of individual, the cowboy, to make all of this work. The long drive was incredibly hazardous. Uh, lots of things could go wrong, and just imagine living for several weeks out in the wilderness while trying to take care of several hundred cattle along the way. Probably the most feared event that might go wrong was the stampede. Cattle are uh, particularly skittish animals, especially during the first day or two of the drive when the process was unfamiliar, and it seemed almost anything could strike a stampede to running. Um, uh, one of the cattle might fall in a hole or uh, get bitten by a rattlesnake or a scorpion. A lightning strike could set off the stampede, and then you've got hundreds of deadly longhorn steer uh, rampaging across the west. We have a number of diaries and, and reports from the cowboys that catalog some of these events. They're very interesting documents to read and study. Uh, one of these reports in 1889 uh, described a stampede that ended with 341 dead cattle, two horses, and one cowboy, in the words of this document, literally mangled to sausage meat.
So these sorts of things were not to be taken lightly. Another hazard was the Indians in the West, which leads to one of the great sort of cliches or tropes or themes in Western history, which is cowboys and Indians. Now, there certainly were occasionally fights between the two sides, and there occasionally were attacks from the Indians upon the cowboys. That is true. But we don't think as often, I think, about the most common relationship between the Indians and the cowboys, and that is the Indians really didn't want to cause trouble. What they wanted, first and foremost, was to be left alone and left to their own devices. And so the most common relationship we see in these documents left by the cowboys is a sort of negotiation with the Indians. If you give us five of your cattle, we will let you go peacefully. And so it became a common practice for the cowboys to uh, prepare to hand over a certain number of their cattle to the Indians along the way, thereby ensuring peaceful passage. Now, assuming one survived this arduous process of the long drive, uh, you would reach the cow town. Uh, this would be the end of the rail line at any particular time. And if you look at your map, uh, as the railroads built out further and further to the west, the railhead changed perhaps from year to year, from Sedalia to Kansas City in Missouri to Abilene or Ellsworth or the famous Dodge City there in Kansas and on across the West. These cow towns would have been uh, a wild and entertaining place, especially for the cowboys just arriving off of their long drive. They are now getting their money. They are ready to relax and kick back and have themselves a time in the cow town. We have many vivid and colorful recollections from the cowboys about what these cow towns looked like. And here is one description of a local saloon where the cowboys flocked. A bartender with a countenance like a youthful divinity student fabricates wonderful drinks, while the music of a piano and a violin from a raised recess enlivens the scene and soothes the savage breasts of those who retire, torn and lacerated from an unfortunate combat with the tiger. The cowboys certainly enjoyed themselves in these saloons in the cow town. And let me read you one of the more colorful descriptions, this from an 1874 memoir about these cow towns. Few more wild, reckless scenes of abandoned debauchery can be seen on the civilized earth than a dance hall in full blast in one of the many frontier towns. To say they dance wildly or in abandoned manner is putting it mildly. The cowboy enters the dance with a particular zest, not stopping to divest himself of his sombrero, spurs, or pistols, but just as he dismounts off his cow pony, so he goes into the dance. A more odd, not to say comical sight, is not often seen than the dancing cowboy. With the front of his sombrero lifted at an angle of 45 degrees, his huge spurs jangling at every step or motion, his revolvers flapping up and down like a retreating sheep's tail, his eyes lit up with excitement, liquor, and lust, he plunges into it and hoes it down at a terrible rate in the most approved yet awkward country style, often swinging his partner clear off the floor in an entire circle. Then balance all with an occasional demonic yell near akin to the war whoop of the savage Indian. All this he does entirely oblivious to the whole world and the rest of mankind. These cow towns, for all the fun and excitement that one might find, were also very dangerous places. And the West in general was only loosely governed and would have possessed only a very mild presence of law and order throughout this period. And so we see that the cowboys and others in the West lived by an unwritten code that we call the Code of the West, which was also in many ways rooted in violence. 
Among the things we must keep in mind regarding this code of the West is that there was very little of a legal presence, and so people were left to their own devices to resolve disputes. It's also likely that many of the cowboys and others in the West were illiterate, and so writing up formal written contracts was an impossibility. And so this code of the West relied on a sense of vigilantism, that is, uh, one must redress his own wrongs, and also uh, a reliance on things like the handshake uh, and a general sense of honesty and integrity in carrying yourself in the West. And so among the things we see in this code is that uh, a man's word is his bond. A handshake is as good as a signed contract. The kinds of things that were reprehensible according to this code involved things like horse stealing or striking a woman or an unarmed man. The solution to any of these sorts of problems would have been violence. If you are insulted or if any of these other things happens, you are to respond. And the weapon of choice, as suggested in this cartoonish picture, was the revolver. And so during this period, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 deaths by gunshot. This is from about 1865 to 1900. And so the West is a very violent and dangerous place to live. Those who survived these hazards enjoyed a great boom in the cattle industry during the 1870s and 80s. There were a number of reasons why the cattle industry flourished during this period. For one, as we will discuss shortly, the buffalo had been hunted almost to extinction at this time. So the cattle had little competition on the plains. On a similar note, the plains Indians were hard-pressed during this period, and so their numbers were diminishing and their threat was also diminished. And finally, the great population boom of the cities back in the Midwest and the East contributed to an incredible demand for beef during this period. And so just remember that the marketplace and the target for this cattle was the East. The cattle would be taken to the railhead and then shipped to Chicago, uh, the great meat packing center of the country where they would be processed for consumption uh, in the eastern cities. The cattle industry also flourished for a number of technological improvements and logistical improvements. Uh, One that seems very simple but in fact transformed the West was the introduction of barbed wire in 1873 by a man named Joseph F. Glidden. Uh, The name may sound vaguely familiar. Glidden today is a paint empire, the same Glidden family. The introduction of barbed wire allowed the fields and uh, different stakes to be claimed, and so uh, one rancher could stake off his territory and confine in his cattle uh, and also keep out others who might wish to poach his cattle. The cattle bonanza was brought to a crushing halt in the winter of 1885 to 86. Now, without some of our most modern ways of recording temperature and wind speeds and so on, uh, we're left to consult the documents to arrive at the conclusion that this was one of the harshest winters our country has ever seen. And the accounts of this winter Uh, leave us with a sense of the incredible disaster that struck. Let me read you one diary entry from this period recalling some of what happened at this time. Nature was busier than she had ever been in the memory of the oldest hunters in that region in fixing up her folks for hard times. The muskrats along the creeks were building their houses to twice their customary height, $1,000 
The walls were thicker than usual, and the muskrat's fur was longer and heavier than any old-timer had ever known it to be. The beavers were working by day as well as night, cutting the willow brush, and observant eyes noted that they were storing twice their usual winter supply. The birds were acting strangely. The ducks and geese, which ordinarily flew south in October, that autumn had a month earlier already departed. The snowbirds and the cedar birds were bunched in the thickets, fluttering around by the thousands in the cane breaks, obviously restless and uneasy. The arctic owls who came only in hard winters were about. And so we get a sense that nature was preparing for this incredibly harsh winter. And indeed, it struck with a vengeance. Blizzards swept across the plains, one after the other. Uh, the recorded temperatures that we do have are staggering. On January 9th, in one location, the temperature reached 46 below, and later that month, 60 below. And still, the cowboys were out in this weather trying to care for the cattle and the herd uh, as the winter wore on, grew more and more debilitated, as you can imagine. The cattle, of course, are out in the middle of this blizzard. One cowboy wrote, Think of riding all day in a blinding snowstorm, the temperature 50 and 60 below zero, and no dinner. You'd get one bunch of cattle up the hill, and another one would be coming down behind you. And it was all so slow, plunging after them through deep snow that way. You'd have to fight every step on the road. The horse's feet were cut and bleeding from the heavy crust, and the cattle had the hair and hide worn off their legs to the knees and hooks. It was surely hell to see big four-year-old steers just able to stagger along. And so this was the nature of this incredibly harsh winter. Ranchers lost about 90% of their herds during that winter, and the few that remained as spring arrived looked much like what you see in this famous painting on the right, waiting for a Chinook or the last of the 5,000. This was the last of the great herd. And what you see is essentially skin and bones. Obviously, cattle in this kind of shape aren't going to bring anyone any money on the open market. And so many, many of the cowboys and cattle ranchers during this period lost their entire stake, lost their herds, and perhaps even worse, many of the cowboys, these incredibly hardened and rugged individuals, saw their spirits crushed by this incredibly harsh winter and just couldn't find it in themselves to stay with it through that next year. The cattle industry dwindled dramatically in the spring of 1886, uh, among other things, seeing competition from sheep ranchers, and sheep uh, became a more common crop in the years after this incredibly harsh winter.